similar that works for our speakers. So there's three sets over here. You can come back by the press too if that works. Good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon, Minnesotans. I uh, want to once again thank the reporters in the room. We have a new group of reporters are taking part in uh, pool reporting, social distancing. It's, uh, it's really great to see the collaboration and making sure we're getting out uh, factual information. Uh, Commissioner Malcolm is going to, uh, to update us, but I think it's, it's important to note uh, we're going and had announced a little earlier today we had 19 fatalities. This has been uh, Minnesota's deadliest day of COVID-19 deaths and also 154 uh, new infections at, in a testing rate that was staying relatively similar. So uh, this is uh, appears to be we're climbing that slope. These have been uh, and this is the uh, the day of the highest infections and highest fatalities. So um, we extend our our sympathies. Every one of those is a life story. Every one is a uh, a brother, sister, spouse, grandparent, um, so extends our our deepest condolences. But I'm uh, I'm glad to be here today. With uh, the other day, uh, when Doug Baker was with us, he mentioned when you have a really tough problem, one of the uh, management truisms is you smother it with talent. Um, I can tell you today, uh, we are smothering this issue of testing with uh, I would argue um, talent better than any place on the planet. Um, and the collaboration that we're going to announce today and the work that's been done to put Minnesota at the forefront of making sure we can test and then just as importantly trace and then equally important um, isolate those cases so that we can get on top of hotspots so that we can understand the extent of the infections and so we can do what we've been talking about from the beginning of this. As I asked uh, folks to stay home as we made incredibly hard choices around our lifestyles and our families. Uh, the plan was relatively simple uh, sounding, much more complicated to carry out. The first was is to make sure that we had the resources at our hospitals, uh, the personal protective equipment, the ventilators, the rooms, and the capacity to build out um, once the infection started to spread through, the, through our community. The second piece of that was was to ensure that we were starting to have a plan that we could isolate and protect the most vulnerable, know who had this, and then look at ways that we could get some of the testing done, both the PCR testing on the molecular testing on the front end, and then serology testing. And I think all of us, again, we want to be very clear. There is no easy fix on this. Um, if you've seen one serology test, it appears like you've seen one serology test because they are not all created equal and they don't have the same outcomes. But um, the difference, I think, in Minnesota is is the quality of the infrastructure of our healthcare systems and the ability of the research uh, communities that surround them um, with the University of Minnesota and other institutions and, and the experts you're going to be hearing from today to put together a plan that actually gives us the best chance, I believe, uh, to do that massive surveillance testing that we're seeing works in other countries. It's working where it's been uh, deployed. And then to start talking about the things that people want to talk about. And I, I want to stress again, uh, the cabin fever people are feeling, the sense of dread they feel around their businesses and their jobs, um, that's permeating all of our thinking all of the time. Uh, wanting to get back to work is not the same as planning to get back to work. And, and I think the thing that we have been shooting for is to be able to announce today what we have done. So I'm proud to stand with these folks. You're going to be hearing from uh, Dr. Jacob Toller, the Dean of the University of Minnesota Medical School and Vice President of Clinical Affairs. You're going to hear from Dr. William Maurice, who serves as the president of Mayo Clinic Laboratories. You're going to hear from Andrea Walsh, president and chief executive officer of Health Partners. And you're going to hear from Dr. Michael Osterholm, Regents Professor, McKnight Presidential Endowed Chair in Public Health and Director for the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. This partnership with the Mayo Clinic and the University of Minnesota and the other healthcare systems we're launching today is testing and providing a strategy to test all symptomatic people isolate confirmed cases, and expand public health surveillance throughout greater Minnesota. Minnesotans, you've heard me say it many, many times that testing is critical. You've heard me talk about numbers and, and the experts, and I'm going to turn it over to them so I don't get out over my skis. Uh, as we were, Dr. Toller mentioned that it's amazing how many people are epidemiologists or infectious disease experts in today's world. Um, here in Minnesota, we turn to those that actually do that work, and this group you're going to hear from is talking about it. And I want to be very clear. 
testing the folks who are symptomatic. When you hear somebody went to the hospital and, and has symptoms and, and can't get a test, um, those, are, those are horrific situations, mainly for the person individually, might uh, the treatment that they could get, but it also talks about the spread of this. Asymptomatic, those folks that have the disease and are asymptomatic and are spreading it to others, so we have to know that. So the capacity that we're announcing today has a capacity to test 20,000 Minnesotans per day. The increased testing and tracing will improve our control of the pandemic and help us think about those strategies to start reopening our society. The partnership will improve control over COVID-19 in Minnesota through increased public surveillance and research. The Mayo Clinic, the University of Minnesota Department of Health, will facilitate contact tracing efforts for better control of the infection. They will identify emerging hotspots um, of infection for rapid intervention before they become critical, and we need to, and we've seen this happen, where we have to shut down critical industries. They'll collect data on prevalence, geographic distribution, and barriers to care for the virus. And they will conduct groundbreaking research on COVID-19 to find the means for the cure. Some of you heard me talk about this, the Minnesota moonshot. At the state of the state, I told the story about this is not a state that's going to just get through COVID-19. This is a state that's going to lead this nation and the world out of this. The folks that have gathered here today are part of that team, and there are thousands behind them doing this. The plan that we put in place should allow Minnesota to be testing at a rate higher than any place else in the country and potentially the world. Um, it's going to matter, and I can't stress this enough, none of this will matter if we do not continue to practice our social distancing that made Minnesota help to flatten the curve. I want to be very, very clear about this. This is not a pass that everything's back to normal and it's all easy from here on out. It is one tool in a toolbox that leads us in that right direction. If we deploy this correctly, now that we have the capacity, if we do the work necessary, when I say we as Minnesotans to continue to social distance and be smart, we've got a path that can lower the number of infections that can ensure the hospital capacity is there for those that are most vulnerable and can give us that path back to start opening more of our society so that people can do what they need to do. So um, please uh, note that one of the things this allows us to do, the lack of testing and the lack of the ability to get into communities, our homeless community and others, um, has left us blind to exactly how deep this problem is in those communities. And so increased testing allows us to, uh, to test those communities most vulnerable. It allows us to get a handle on, and I, I can't say enough about Paul Snell and the folks over at the Department of Corrections, but as you're seeing across the country, anything that's a congregate care living situation or a congregate care work situation is incredibly dangerous. And the ability to be able to test massively across those uh, industries, across those uh, settings, is one of the best ways we can ensure that we can isolate folks that are most vulnerable and get back to where we need to go. So uh, we'll be increasing the number of case investigators. I want to thank the folks over at the Minnesota Department of Health that are the experts in this. This is tough work. This is hard things to get uh, to get this information. And I want to once again ask Minnesotans for your cooperation on this. We're going to have to help do this. Who's been in contact with who so that we can start isolating those folks and, and start again focusing on the, the ideas of how do we come back from this. So with that, I'm going to turn it over first to, uh, to Commissioner Malcolm, and then I'll introduce the rest of our team as they come up. Commissioner. Thank you very much, Governor. Very much appreciate your leadership as always. Good afternoon, Jan Malcolm, Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Health. I'm going to begin with just our, our typical um, kind of situation update on the facts and figures. Globally, as of this morning, Unfortunately, we were at nearly 2.6 million cases of infected individuals across our world and 178,000 deaths. In the United States this morning, we were reporting over 825,000 cases and over 45,000 deaths. And again, the speed of this growth has truly been breathtaking and heartbreaking. In Minnesota, as the governor has already shared, we added another 154 laboratory confirmed cases. And with what we're going to be talking about today, we should expect to see those numbers um, start increasing more rapidly as we're, as we're looking more broadly and finding more confirmed cases. And sadly, a new total of 179 deaths in our state, up 19 from Minnesota. So, as, as the governor has said, this is a sad day in terms of reporting the highest numbers yet and uh, seeing that increase in numbers, but it's a hopeful day because of what we're here to announce. The, uh, the 19 deaths that we announced today include 18 from Hennepin County, one in Nobles County. 16 of the deaths, once again, occurred in residents of long-term care facilities. 
the demographics uh, of those who, who have passed away most recently, two people in their 90s, eight in their 80s, seven in their 70s, one person in their 60s, and one person in their 50s with significant underlying health conditions. So the pattern that we've talked about over and over again uh, continues to be much the same in terms of the, the, the folks who are most vulnerable to, to severe cases of this disease. We also like to talk about the people who are successfully coming through the infection. 1,317 patients have now been released from isolation. There are 240 patients currently hospitalized, 107 of those in intensive care. Interestingly, the ICU number is down 10 from yesterday, which means uh, some of the, the folks uh, have successfully come through the, uh, the ICU stage of their disease. I'm going to transition at this point into uh, what we're so very excited to be able to announce today, and that is uh, this exciting partnership to really follow through on the governor's goal and everyone's um, shared goal of expanding testing dramatically in Minnesota. I want to start just by uh, giving you an update a little bit on the governor's work group that has been cr really creating the strategy to increase testing, but then to use that increased testing to also increase public health protections. Uh, this is a work group that is uh, co-led by our partner, Dr. M Dr. Michael Osterholm from the University of Minnesota. And there's some very important principles in the strategy itself that are going to guide the, the implementation, which is what we're going to talk about with this partnership. The goals that the work group has laid out, the objectives, are, as the governor has said, starting with priority patients, we must ensure PCR testing of all symptomatic Minnesotans. We've not been able to achieve that at, heretofore because each system's kind of been, each healthcare delivery system has kind of been trying their best with their own resources to, to uh, prioritize testing of the most critical, the people for whom a, a rapid PCR test matters to their clinical course. And that was the people who were admitted to the hospital uh, for severe disease already. We've known all along that that was not an adequate amount to be testing, but each system was trying to problem solve on its own. One day uh, vexed with uh, problems on the back end of not having enough laboratory uh, capacity, not having enough reagents or what have you in the public health lab or in their own labs. Um, and then it became an issue about testing capacity on the front end, the collection, uh, the collection of samples and the, and the difficulties posed by lack of PPE for workers, but also something as simple as lack of the right kind of swabs. So I think we've talked before about what's the problem? Why is it so hard to ramp up these numbers? But it's, it was each system kind of trying their best on their own, but without really a coordinated support structure that held that, uh, held that back. So we've not been able to, to test every symptomatic patient for some time, and that's been a, a major challenge and a major barrier to really getting our handle around what's the true uh, incidence of the disease in our community. So ensuring PCR testing of all symptomatic Minnesotans is goal one. And we believe very strongly that both PCR testing and serologic testing, as we're able to figure out how best to deploy that, really need to be done with the fastest possible turnaround time. That means testing as close to home as possible um, so that we can really uh, maximize getting that information into the hands of clinicians immediately. And very importantly, testing, both PCR and serol serologic, need to be conducted strategically. As the governor said, it's not just about throwing a bunch of tests out there indiscriminately. We need to know which tests are most indicated in which situations, both to, and to meet public health goals, which include goals supporting clinical practice, so uh, uh, diagnosis and treatment, and that's the PCR, molecular side of this, but also the population health goals, surveillance and containment of spread. So, of spread. so we need to be strategic and understand what we know and what we don't know about the, the appropriate role of each of these tests and how good the tests are and what they're good for and what kind of situation. So we intend for this strategy to drive a really smart application of these tests, not just tests for test's sake, but because we know what to do with the results for both clinical and population health goals. Uh, the, the work group has, has also developed, in addition to these broad principles, some strategies. It's got to be about rapidly and increasing testing capacity throughout the state. Secondly, it has to fully utilize available and growing existing capacity in hospital-based labs 
reference labs, and research labs. So this is not about taking testing capacity away from one to give it to another. Um, Andrea Walsh will speak about what Health Partners has been doing. Hennepin Healthcare has also been building a lot of capacity that we're going to need, especially to, uh, to test some of our priority populations. So this is about maximizing everyone's capability, but doing it in a really coordinated way. Resolving supply chain issues, taking advantage of the purchasing power of the large reference labs, and making sure that across the system we're able to actually share those supplies in real-time basis to make sure that we can get the get the testing to where the patient and population need is. Reducing cost barriers. We have a commitment that no Minnesotan is going to not get a test because they, they, they can't afford it or they don't have coverage. This is to test every Minnesotan with, with specific focus on vulnerable populations. We've got work to, yet to do, but we know it's very important to figure out how to work inside a very complex billing system uh, to make sure that we're maximizing every dime of revenue coming into this system that we can. So what we're announcing today is both some of the, the principles behind the, the testing plan itself, and I'm not talking today as much about the, the other end of the continuum. That is what we're going to do with all of this information to ramp up the contact tracing, the disease investigations, the contact tracing, and then the isolation and quarantine strategies, which are going to be done in close coordination with our partners in local public health uh, to make sure that we can quickly use this information to do the disease investigation and control part of this process. We can talk about that more at another time. But what we're here to announce is both the principles of this statewide plan, but also this a phase one agreement, which we literally have just this morning um, executed. And I want to thank my partner, uh, Commissioner Myron Franz, at Minnesota Management and Budget, who really helped uh, in close coordination with the healthcare systems and our two uh, central laboratory partners here to really to put together in incredibly short time, um, the, the specifics of how we can start this as fast as possible. So we're calling this the phase one agreement to implement this strategy. This is an agreement between the major hospital systems in the state to all sign on to these priority goals and to work collectively, not just individually, but as part of a cohesive whole with the need for central lab capacity to support and augment the current capacity that, is, that exists in the health systems. Mayo Clinic and the University of Minnesota came together just in recent days to agree to collaborate to create several critical things. First, this central lab capacity to accommodate the expanded testing volumes that the state needs. Second, building a, what we're referring to as a virtual command center in coordination with the health systems and the Minnesota Department of Health to manage the daily flow of testing to assure that these increasing goals are met. And this partnership also brings us the capacity to partner with the state on cutting edge analytics and research to inform, again, the, the proper and best and highest use of these tests to achieve both the clinical and the population health goals, but also the ways in which this, this real world uh, learning that we're doing, this applied research capability that we will have to inform the best testing strategies, the best containment strategies, and ideally feeding into the search for, uh, for treatment uh, as, as well as prevention. So it's a, it's a, it's a big deal. So what we, are, what we are doing today, we'll be uh, issuing another uh, health alert message out to the health alert network statewide is to set clear direction to the health systems. And I know the CEOs have all already begun to do this, that we're, we're removing that any confusion about who needs to be tested and saying every symptomatic Minnesotan must be tested as soon as possible. We want to stress intensive testing of vulnerable populations, including, as the governor has said, and as you have seen in our data, Minnesotans living in congregate settings and those experiencing homelessness, staff that serve these vulnerable populations, healthcare workers, specifically communities of color and American Indian populations whom we know are at higher risk of severe disease and also workforce for critical infrastructure. Since day one, the governor's been talking about the importance of the daycare infrastructure um, and of those who, uh, who are working in critical sectors. And uh, one of my, um, one of the things I'm most excited about with is, is the opportunity to work in this really cohesive way with these partners to be able to better, more quickly respond to the hotspots that we're seeing uh, uh, 
come up. That's just going to be critical to both controlling the, the spread of the disease, but also supporting those specific populations and learning best how to do that. Uh, so what we're what we have just executed um, to re to build this mechanism and to start hitting these rapidly increasing testing goals uh, is being funded. This first phase, which is a fast moving phase, we're talking about a few weeks here uh, to get this built and to ramp up the testing volumes to where we're talking about. Uh, we're funding that with a, a 36 million dollar. Um, withdrawal from the COVID-19 fund, which the legislature uh, thankfully gave us a great deal of flexibility to be able to move fast on opportunities like this when they present themselves. But we will also immediately begin partnering with the legislature on uh, how we will follow this science, how we will use this capacity that's being built very quickly in order to really roll out the, you know, the broader longer term plan for Minnesota. That, that is going to take a lot more resources and a very close partnership with the legislature to figure out how best to deploy Minnesota's resources as well as to take the best use of the federal funding that we, uh, we hope and believe is on the way. So I couldn't be uh, more grateful to these partners and, and prouder of uh, our state's collective approach to this to say we're going to do this together. We're going to maximize what our health care systems can do. We're going to take fullest advantage of the unique assets that we have here in Minnesota through Mayo and the university and through our strong public health system. So with that, uh, Governor, I'll turn it back to you. Dr. Toller. Thank you, Commissioner. Good afternoon, everyone. This is a good day. This is a glorious day. It's an Earth Day 2020. This is one for the ages because out of all that globe that has been suffering under this pandemic, there is one piece of it, and that is the state of Minnesota that I am the most proud of. This is why, because we have a leadership in the governor, in the commissioner, Malcolm, Commissioner France, and others that understand the enormous power of science in making decisions on societal basis. So that ability to understand what is essential but invisible, as Little Princess in St. Exupery, that is what's behind our effective ability to respond to this pandemic. So thank you, Governor, Commissioners. Thank you for the leadership in the state. Almost equally, I am grateful to President Gable. President Gable is a visionary leader of the University of Minnesota, and she represents the land-grant university, which is the first dictum of which is to serve Minnesotans, serve the community, and really deliver on what we need to do in the state of Minnesota for the patients, for their families, and for everybody there. So whom I represent here are the people that are behind that science, that science that has changed medicine and epidemiology for that matter from magic 200 years ago to actually something you can do something about. So we are no longer to be seen in this state as victims of this pandemic, but rather vectors. You know, that's the, you can deconstruct that. You know, you can do something about this. And all these prognostications, all these Twitter storms, you know, all these, you know, social media events, I'm not big on social media, but my teenagers tell me, it's, uh, it is the one reason that I can think of why the prognostication is important is to change it, you know, do something about it. And that's why Minnesota is different than others. That's why Minnesota and its university is seen as a information and action hub, national and internationally, because we have been able, under the President Gable's leadership, to actually deconstruct that problem and represent you know, the science behind it. So what is the science? The science started at, uh, from the, you know, I'm gonna talk about the testing because that's why we are here today. It started from some of our investigators to looking at that virus at a very, very enlarged way. And so the virus looks like a, like a chew toy of your dog. You know, it has these little spikes and with the, with the technology called cryo-electron microscopy, they've been able, at the veterinary medicine and the medical school, we able to understand the interaction between the cell, which is the, the epithelial cell in the lung, and the, the virus itself. From that, we have taken that, that would be like beginning of March or end of February. We've taken that, and my center for immunology at the university has taken that and developed a antibody testing, antibody, you know, a serologic you know, testing, whereby we can detect the response to that 
chew toy of your dog, literally speaking, the spike protein of that. And from that, we have taken it to the lab. And from that, we have scaled it up to the point that the commissioner, the governor, everybody else can use it. Because we are here, ultimately, as a land-grant university, to serve Minnesotans, everyone. As you said, vulnerable people that cannot you know, practice social distancing, everyone across the greater Minnesota. And that's why we do this. You mentioned supply chains. Very importantly, if you can deconstruct the testing, being that the polymerase chain reaction for the molecular, being then the serology, if you can really take the individual modules out of the equation, you are independent. So the beauty of the testing at the University of Minnesota is that most of it is not dependent on the regular supply chains. It is, in fact, something that, you know, I have a PhD. I came here 30 years ago to get a PhD in molecular biology. Um, you can actually develop your test and you are independent. So you own your future. So we own the, the, not just the mission of the university, but we own that, that gravity of the epidemic for the, for the Minnesotans. The second group that I represent here are the clinicians. I think, you know, you, you uh, and the governor mentioned it at the beginning, you know, this is, this is personal. This is, you know, you know 2,000 people is a statistic. If this is your grandmother, this is not a statistic. You know, this is something that's going to change you and me and others, you know, for the rest of your life. So this is, this is important because these clinicians that I represent and with my partner, James Hereford, on the M Health Fairview, we have this COVID-19 hospital in Bethesda, not that distant from here. Um, that is where these selfless, utterly exhausted people practice not heroism. It looks like heroism for where you stand, you know, because it's so distant. From their standpoint, it's an act of decency. I am doing my job. That's, that's what they do. And my, my work, my, my service is to them, with my teams, is to support them with the protective equipment, with the ventilators, with the swabs, with the ant antibody testing, with the serology testing. That is why the University of Minnesota teams, we have started month, two months ago to build new lines of the masks new lines of the low-cost ventilators, new lines of the molecular testing and serology testing, this COVID-19 hospital, research that goes behind. This is a different disease, by the way, than influenza. This is really different than the other coronaviruses. These are these small clots that go to the lung, go to the brain, go everywhere, to the kidneys. This is different, you know, and we need that science to really, you know, be able to do that. So what you need to know is we trained for this. This is, this is, you know, I'm, I'm an intensive care unit doctor. I'm a bone marrow transplant physician. I deal with people that are very, very sick. And we trained for this. We built for this. We have six health science schools at the University of Minnesota. This College of Science and Engineering, College of Design, and Health Fairview. And of course, my dear friends and colleagues at Mayo Clinic are in that, in that partnership together. So what we, what we really are here to do is to provide that service to the, to the greater Minnesota, not just Metro. You know, people should get excellent health care, not because they live close to a big hospital or they have a good paycheck. No, everybody, you know, the, 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 the access to reasonable medical care is, in my opinion, a fundamental human right. It is something, you know, that should be allowed to everyone. That's why I'm proud of this state. And we should move that, 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 that inevitable initial emotion, which is that one of uh, fear and pity you know, that all of us are exposed to, you know, in the realm of the uh, pandemic to a scientific, moral, uh, almost symbolic responsibility for the sickness of our uh, Minnesotans. So I'm here for that, and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Toller. Governor. Dr. Maurice from the Mayo Clinic. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Toller. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you, Governor Walsh, uh, for your leadership and Commissioner Malcolm. Uh, as a person who's raised his family in Minnesota, I just want to say how incredibly proud I am to be a member of the state and humbled to have such great partnerships and so many good colleagues around the state to work with. Um, and, and at Mayo Clinic, we have really had the opportunity to be at the forefront of this in terms of a testing perspective, since the, really since the early days of the crisis. And so to date, we now have done 120,000 molecular tests for COVID in the Rochester facility and also in our Arizona and Florida facilities. And uh, in addition, we've done 30,000 just for Minnesotans. And today, we can do about 7,500 molecular tests and over 20,000 serologic tests in our laboratories. Uh, again, since the early days of this 
hitting Minnesota. We've been working with the other great healthcare systems in the state, the other great providers to see what we could do to make that, cap that capacity that we have in Rochester and at Mayo available to the, to the other providers and people in the state. And also been very grateful for working with other state leaders and Governor Walsh and other state leaders to make that capacity available through the Department of Health as well. We have help with some of the backlog issues there. Uh, and going forward, we really are going to be focused on not just building the capacity in Rochester and in our Mayo Clinic facilities, but very much invested in helping the entire state, all the healthcare systems, get access to and the capability to do the testing that they need to do to safely take care of all of our neighbors here uh, in the state of Minnesota. So that's really why I'm so proud of this collaborative effort. It's more than just the University of Minnesota and Mayo. It really is the, all of the healthcare providers in the state really growing the capabilities they need to take care of all of us and keep us safe. Because of the size of our laboratory operations in Rochester, we are also privileged to have strong relationships with a lot of industry leaders outside of the lab, uh, those who provide the equipment, such as Roche and others, Thermo Fisher. Uh, we will be working hard to make that relationship that we have at Mayo Clinic to benefit all Minnesotans by helping with the supply chain issues, which have been so vexing. Uh, to know that someone needs to be tested and that, to not be able to get something like a nasal swab is really uh, disappointing for all of us and really something that, as Minnesotans, we should make sure does not happen again. And Mayo Clinic we'll do whatever we can to make sure that that is the case. Also, I mean, it's often not known outside of Rochester, but we do testing for patients around the country and around the world. Uh, we did 25 million tests in Rochester last year alone. We want to make sure that that infrastructure that can provide safe and reliable testing to anyone that sends it to us typically within 24 hours is really focused on the state. Uh, we have been prioritizing state needs since the inception of this. We will continue to do so. Uh, really want to leverage what we have there to, number one, uh, restore public confidence in their safety. I mean, that's really job number one for healthcare right now for Minnesotans is for people to feel safe, feel like they understand this pandemic. Without knowledge, there's only fear. So we will continue to leverage all the resources that we have in collaboration with our partners to make sure that we can tackle this problem as a state together. Um, and also, we will continue to innovate uh, at the university, uh, throughout the state, at Mayo. We'll continue to innovate to find better ways to make the diagnosis, uh, to detect COVID, which is so important. And so we'll make those innovations available to all Minnesotans through this partnership as well, which is really exciting. And last but not least, the question, of course, is how do we get back on the path to normalcy, whatever normalcy looks like as we come through this. Clearly, uh, different therapeutic options beyond social distancing is going to be an important part of that. Again, places like the University of Minnesota Mayo Clinic uh, will have the opportunity to lead some of these efforts. As an example, we're one of the site leaders for the National Anti-Plasma Program, which can be used as an early treatment, has been used in many other infectious uh, outbreaks in the past and we want to make that available here in this country and we're really committed to taking those tools as we develop them and making sure they don't just benefit people in Rochester or people in Eau Claire or one of our health system sites but to make sure that they benefit all Minnesotans uh, through this program and that's why I'm just so delighted to be part of it and so so proud and so appreciative of leadership bringing this together and on the open-mindedness of all the leaders in the state to really come together in a very rapid fashion to help us address collectively a problem that we can't overcome by ourselves. Thank you, Dr. Grace. So thank you. Andrew. Thank you. Thanks so much. As CEO at Health Partners, where we serve 1.2 million patients and 1.8 million health plan members, I applaud and thank you, Governor, for your leadership. We have needed to advance a vision for statewide COVID-19 testing, and so I want to applaud and thank you, thank the commissioners who are here today and our partners across the healthcare community. In recent weeks, social distancing has helped us slow the spread of disease and given us the time we need to be ready. Looking forward, expanding testing and contact tracing is a necessary building block to help us work towards reopening Minnesota. We need this public-private partnership to expand COVID-19 testing and to implement stronger tracing and isolation processes. It's crucial for several reasons. It'll help us prevent the spread of disease and keep each other healthy and safe. Secondly, it will expand access to care for patients without COVID-19 who may be delaying care that they need today. Third, we'll also be able to expand testing while we continue to test, to do the tests that we need to protect our doctors, our nurses, and care teams. For example, when a care team a caregiver gets a negative test result, 
they can get back to caring for patients instead of being quarantined for 14 days. A negative test also helps us know when to use personal protective equipment and when we can save it for those in need. In Minnesota, we have the best health systems in the world. We collaborate and we compete with each other all the time. And by doing that, we improve quality in this state and we improve the health of the communities that we serve. And we're seeing that very thing today. At Health Partners, for example, we have deep capabilities to reach people and to collect and direct test processes. As the pandemic began, we created drive-through testing centers and dedicated respiratory care centers. We expanded our lab capabilities greatly and continue to do all of these things today. And we want to do more. And we recognize one of our key challenges to doing more is securing testing supplies. We expect that this new central lab capability that we're building together will help us solve exactly that problem. The reality, as Dr. Marie said, is no single system can do this alone. We need each other, and we're fortunate to have each other in this state. At Health Partners, we're proud to be part of this work, and we're ready to do our part. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Osterholm. Thank you, Governor Walls, uh, Commissioner Malcolm, other distinguished uh, guests here today. Uh, let me just say, first of all, uh, I think what Minnesota wants here today is everything that can be done being done. Yeah. I, can assure, I can assure you that what you heard today, in fact, is the model for what is what will be a statewide testing program, not only how to do the test, but how to use the test. And I can speak to this as having been one of the co-chairs of this work group that was a very inclusive effort uh, of individuals from many walks of life uh, here in Minnesota. And the fact of the matter is, is that we will be able to uh, do everything we possibly can to deal with this situation. While it's very hard for Minnesotans to hear this, it's very important they understand we are in the very first innings of this game. This is not going to get over with anytime soon. Uh, quite honestly, well less than 5% of our population in this state have ever been infected by this virus. This virus will not rest until at least 60 to 70% of our population has either been infected and then hopefully develop immunity or we have a vaccine. At this point, we very much hope we'll have a vaccine one day, but hope is not a strategy. And so we don't know. So everything we can do that you've heard about today is going to be critical to helping Minnesotans deal with this experience with this virus, which is going to be with us for some time. Please take this seriously. Thinking about this as just what it's done so far with its very limited footprint, you understand why what we're doing here today is so critically important. The other thing I just have, must say, I, I guess it's probably protocol that when you get up to the podium like this in the governor's standard, you have to thank him and tell him he's doing a great job. But let me add a, a personal professional perspective to that. Uh, I've served two Republican governors, two Democratic governors, one independent governor, a state epidemiologist. I've served roles in the last five presidential administrations, including this one as science envoy in the State Department last year. And I can honestly say I would say this, regardless of who is standing up here if I didn't believe it, that in fact this is as good a uh, response that any state I've seen has been able to do. And I thank you on behalf of my kids and grandkids who are residents of this state for doing that. And I think that what we all have to also understand is we are going to have hard days ahead, very hard days, and we have to hang together. And I am really very, very uh, uh, much in agreement with what you've heard about the congratulatory message, but I'm even more confident in the fact that in the hardest days we do have ahead, the kinds of programs we're seeing put in place right now will be what will sustain us. They will be what will get us through. And the leadership that we need, I believe, is also equally important. And I also am very appreciative for that. So with that, uh, let me just say testing is critical. It's going to be done. It's going to be done right. How these tests are used will be done. It will be done right. And I think that's what Minnesotans want to hear today. That's what Minnesotans want to know. Are we doing what we can do, what we must do? And uh, thank you, Governor, for making that happen. Thank you, Commissioner Malcolm. Well, thank you, Mike. That means a lot coming from you since you are more well known than I am in Minnesota. So uh, for your work that you've done um, to this entire group um, on behalf of 5.7 million Minnesotans, I say thank you. And to the Minnesotans that are out there, um, 
these people that you see here and the institutions that they represent, and a thank you to uh, Dr. Faruja at the Mayo Clinic and to President Gable and to all of the CEOs who uh, Andrea Walsh is representing in, in all of those. Um, this is what the investment over 150 years into our great land grant university and 100 years of investments into our healthcare systems has made that we are prepared to take this on we're prepared to do it together and the country needs us to do it so uh, i am grateful for that i am grateful for the incredible uh partnership and the thought there's a few people that i i do want to thank in this i think it's important um we've got some chairs in the legislature working really hard as partners with this uh, chairwoman tina liebling in the house and uh, senator michelle benson in the senate these folks are working hard, and we know we partner together. It's a time of emergency, but the importance of that legislative body of thinking about this, helping build these coalitions, uh, we're going to need to go for the long haul. I, I, the one thing Dr. Ostrom tells you the way it is, this is a folks that are, that are grounded in science and grounded in outcomes. Um, we've got work to do here, and we're going to have to, we're going to have to band together to get it done. And I'm going to, before I take questions, uh, thank Chris Smitter. There's a lot of names you don't hear a lot of. He's the chief of staff for my office. And those of you who understand how things work, uh, th this is one of the hardest jobs in state government. Um, and it's one that uh, I couldn't have found anybody else better to do that. With that, I would uh, take questions for this whole group. And we'll just bring them up if you ask them. Let us know who you want. Governor Kent Erdahl with CARE 11 News. Minnesotans and Americans have heard <clears throat> promises about if you need a test, you will get a test in the past. It's been pretty well publicized. What should Minnesotans expect in terms of any kind of timeline to see that happening? And who they should who should they hold accountable if they don't get the test that they want? Right? Me. Me on that. And that's the way this has to be. Um, it's putting it together. These folks have the expertise. And I want to be very clear. It's not that there weren't doing testing or trying to do testing. There was just such a dis, uh, disjointed system of how things were being done. And then there was not a clear message from anybody across. I was on the call just before coming here with 50 governors. We spent an hour, all of them. This is the issue that everybody's facing. So one thing that we've talked about is we need to have a place of accountability, a place where things flow. And, and just to be clear, I'm not the expert in testing. These folks are, and the, and the trashing, and, and Jan is. And I think what we're looking at, and I, I, I want to be very clear, when I got over my skis and talked about numbers, it was to challenge my team. I had to go to the experts and ask them what they can do. And I don't know if anybody here would like to talk about when can they expect to get this. And I'm saying you go in, you're symptomatic, anybody who needs a test, and if a doctor's saying you need a test, you should get one, how that's going to look. And, and I want in our dashboard, I want those numbers to be seen um, by Minnesotans and expect where it is. But I will start with this plan and this program and the delivering of the testing. The responsibility to make sure to Minnesotans to get that done does lie with me. And that's where you're going to, Jan, maybe yep. talk. Well, I'll just uh, reiterate what we said a little bit earlier. And we, we have been struggling with the fact we know we've had underutilized capacity. And it's been driving us all to distraction because having people needing tests, knowing the tests are out there but they're in the wrong place or the supplies aren't matched up on the, on the collection end with the back end. So what I, we, we believe from the data that we've gotten from the health systems themselves that, that there, there's today a capacity to do 8,000 tests a day if we can get everything moving and really connected. Um, the goal here is to build up to a capacity of 20,000 a day and that's between the health systems and, and Mayo and you what they think they could produce. I would be kidding if I said that's going to be tomorrow that that happens. But so that why I said we're going to we're sending out a message today to make it more clear that we're standing behind the health systems to assure that if they collect those samples they'll get processed. That so that, so that um, sending out the, the word test every symptomatic person. That's your job in the healthcare system. It's our job to build the system to make it uh, to make it happen. So that message is going out today. I know it's going to take a little while to filter down, but you will start seeing significantly increased numbers, I believe, starting tomorrow. I think you've already seen it. We've already seen a little uptick just in the last day or so. Andrew, you want to go to Dr. Just briefly, you know, as we set up drive-through testing um, capacity at the beginning of the, the, the pandemic, 
um, the level of interest in getting a test was incredibly high, whether you have symptoms or not. And I think the, the role that we have as health systems together is to help people identify when do you need to get a test, and if you need a test, where do you go to get it? So we will be working in partnership to set up places where we can have testing occur. The tests need to be collected, and then the tests need to be sent to a lab. And our challenge has been that the testing capacity the lab capacity has been um, inadequate. We could collect more than we could actually get processed across the entire state because of the testing shortages that the commissioner mentioned, whether it was reagents, swabs, or what have you. The power in this partnership is figuring out our supply chain better together so that we can confidently ramp up collection processing of tests and know that we have the capacity on the back end for those tests to be performed. So you need to understand that the anxiety that comes with not knowing whether you are positive or not is as contagious as the virus itself. And it's one of the phenomenal gestures you know, in this, that we can alleviate that anxiety with science. So the testing itself, the science behind it, it's like Google Maps. You know where to go. But whether you're going to go, you need a leader. You need a governor and his team. You have a you know, president and her team. You need somebody in the leadership who said, this is the intent. This is where I'm going. And you go out and do this. So this is exactly why I'm saying to you, this is simple. You know, we do tough stuff. But PCR and ELISA, which is what the tests are called, they are simple as they get. You might entry-level students, you know, do these things on a routine basis. But what is not simple is the logistics of it. How many hundreds of the stations across the metro are we going to have? How are we going to get this to the greater Minnesota? How are we going to get it to the tribal nations? How are we going to get this everywhere when people need this? That is, you know, where the logistics and the planning, you know, needs to come, you know, for and foremost. So I'm telling you this is simple in a way. You know, the rollout, you know, based on, you know, the, the, the discussions we had today, this should take literally two, to your questions, two, three weeks, you know, not more than that. And maybe less. I'd rather under-promise than, you know, over-promise and over-deliver and under-promise, right? Uh, speed is an essential ingredient in success. So the faster we're going to do this, the better we're going to do. Thank you, Governor. Um, the, really, the, I mean, that's the question, right? When can I get a test? I mean, that's what everyone's seeing this. That's what's going to be in their mind. It's what I hear at my home uh, on a daily basis. Um, the challenges are really twofold. One is that you had this immediate overwhelming need for new tests that didn't exist three months ago. Uh, that's why innovation is a big part of this. And the other is even where the testing capacity exists, how do you access it? We know that there's reserves and how do we coordinate? And that's why really this, this the, the thought leadership and from the governor and his team to say we need to basically stand up a capacity where we have it, but also have the coordination so that because the actual needs in the state are going to be very dynamic. There might be one area that has a pending outbreak that if we're going to accomplish what we all want to do, we have to focus resources there. And this will allow that level of coordination, allow us who have the capability to build up capacity more quickly before it can be disseminated out through other health systems to do that early to serve all Minnesotans. And then last but not least, it's really about the thought leadership that, and that's why I'm so proud of the state, because it's one thing to have the information. Uh, really, who needs the information most acutely, right? How do we prioritize to make sure that people really needing the testing get the testing? I have a number of family members that are in healthcare here in the Twin Cities, uh, including nursing at St. Joe's. I mean, these are really important that these people get answers quickly, right? Um, and, and so that we continue to think not just about getting the test out there, but really be thought leaders as a state about how do we get the information from the testing first to help take, take care of the crisis, and then the longer questions about what does it mean to have an antibody? Does that make me safe to go back to work? These are the questions that we can answer much more quickly together with the governor's and his team's leadership than we can on our own. And that's why this is so important, I think, for all Minnesotans. Logistically, what is it going to look like for a test to get to someone in greater Minnesota who's sick or a critical worker or one of the other classes that you talked about? And who's responsible for getting that test to that person? Yeah. Look. Well, what the doc I, I was hoping that the governor was going to say, I am responsible. I never that was a really good response, I thought. I never wrote the <laughs> so I don't have that. Uh, a 
essential, fundamental question, ma'am. Uh, this is, uh, we have to go and make this possible. We, we have to go there. You know, what I am envisioning is that I'm going to use University of Minnesota Extension. I'm going to use, I have, you know, University of Minnesota Medical School trains 70 percent of physicians in the state. We have primary care docs and family docs every single, you know, place you're going to look. We can deploy, you know, these, you know, these tests in, in that direction and people know how to find their local doc, right? So that's one. The second one is I really, and I think it was Dr. Maurice who said this first, this is really important to go and, uh, and target populations and groups, long-term, you know, facilities, living facilities, you know, again, tribal nations, you know, uh, it may be a plant, you know, in, in a, you know, food plant or so. You have to go there and actually make it available, make it easy for people to do the right thing and make it easy for them to, to really have the, uh, the chain back, you know, which is to get the testing within, I would say, you know, 24 hours, you know, is that very reasonable turnaround. And then let's not forget, some of the people need to be tested more frequently than just once yeah. because my healthcare workers who go and take care, nurses, pharmacists, clinicians, doctors, go and take care of these COVID-19 patients in Bethesda Hospital over there in St. Joe's, they are exposed every day. Right? So they need to be. And the last group that, let's not forget, you know, the, I have patients with cancer, other disorders. They are waiting now, you know, for surgeries that they absolutely have to have, right? I need to get them back. You know, we need to serve people who are not COVID-19 sick, but they just happen to be sick equally. Dr. Maurice, do you want to add, do you want to follow up on that? I think this one's really important because these are the questions I asked, and I, I think operationally, maybe these two can give really quick anecdotes on, on what we're doing. Well, but hopefully I'm getting the same answer there. It's more pressure now. Um, you know, it, this is, again, a critically important question. You know, as president of Mayo Clinic Labs, I mentioned we do testing for healthcare systems outside of Rochester, outside of the state. It's always been our intent under Dr. Frugia's leadership that if someone uses our clinical laboratories, they should get the same exact service as if they're a doctor working at Mayo Clinic. And that holds true here as well. Uh, I think the partnership's really important because uh, other healthcare systems have much more of a footprint across the state that can really give the patients access to getting the specimens collected and things they need. But we can be part of that solution in terms of using, we have a logistical network to turn around most of our tests within 24 hours. And we can now harness that and what we've invested there with the state to actually make that available and to make things go through operationally. And what we know about operations and helping to scale operations is something that we'll be able to bring to the table to help make this all work. Okay. Yeah, you want to explain what that can look like? This is uh, early on in what we're doing, but I, I think uh, the question you're asking is really good. Of, of what happens when you have an outbreak? What happens if you want to get in there? What's that actually going to look like? Yeah, so I think um, what we're seeing just in recent days is the need to support this kind of an effort uh, down in Worthington and Nobles County and that region of the state where we've got, you know, major, uh, m major, uh, organizations involved in the critical uh, food chain, food supply, and when there's due to just the circumstances of that kind of work, there's a, uh, we start to see cases, we want to intervene really quickly, we want to understand how far is the spread in that region, in those counties, uh, and, in, and in these particular uh, settings where because of the, the workforce and the, 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 way, the way that the workforce moves around and the crowded housing conditions that some of those workers are in. It's just so important to try to get our arms around uh, understanding what, how, how big is the spread and what do we do to, to ramp up the isolation and containment uh, that is needed, isolation and quarantine. So what we're doing down there is working with Sanford, which is the, the local health care provider, to try to ramp up testing really quickly, which they're, they're very uh, willing and able to do. Um, so that's a, that's a case where it's it's going it's going well. We've got uh, we've got a, a strategy in place, but we there's lots of issues to work through in terms of uh, making sure that those employees know you know where to come to get testing. But what's what's been the barrier um, previously is for a, a healthcare system that would want to be able to do that, but doesn't have doesn't have a, a capacity or they've had experience with wherever they've been sending their. Their, uh, their lab results that aren't getting back very fast to be able to give them a, a you know a, a closer to home better faster option and it's our job to get the finances out of the way 
for that happening, and that's part of what's been a, a challenge in recent weeks. So that we'll be able to support the local care systems that are closest to those, those outbreaks, and where that isn't an easy connection to make, to have access to a team from the university or a team from Mayo who can help uh, supplement that on-site uh, activity really quickly is, is what the, I, I envision this being really helpful for, for some of those hot spots uh, right away. And I know, and again, I'll mention just Hennepin Healthcare has, has offered to help us with some of the hot spot work in uh, long-term care facilities in the county. Absolutely, we we want and need to, uh, to to take them up on that. Great, thank you. Yes, and Matt Sepik from NPR News. I have a question for either of the physicians here about the accuracy of these tests, uh, both the PCR and the serology test. How accurate is it, and uh, how do you know that? Can I go for it? Okay. <laughs> this is a very good question, of course, because any test, you know, is only as useful as it's accurate. And we look at uh, what we call specificity and sensitivity. I'm not going to go through the details of this, but you can get a test that is uh, what we call false positive, which means that, you know, nothing happened and, you know, the reading, you know, is positive, or false negative, that is, you had, in fact, some, you know, product in there and, uh, and the test didn't show it. So when we did our antibody testing, you know, in the in the development, we had 87 percent, you know, on each side first. But then when we refined it, we were 100 percent there. So the the inaccuracy, if you will, which is a part of any kind of a testing that you're going to do, is mostly a function of how you collect the specimen and how you take care of the specimen. So typically, we would get the virus from the back of your throat, the nasopharyngeal swab. Uh, we would get the serology from blood. So the obvious the ability to collect the antibody is a little less open to variants than the, you know, getting a swap in somebody's throat. So the P PCR, which is the molecular test, the nasopharyngeal swap one, uh, that is the one that is more sensitive to how you collect the sample than the one on the serology side. I also need to say that, as in any science that we do, it's a reference range, you know, that is important. So we have positive and negative control. That's how we know that the different components of the reaction actually are working as we want to. And this way, you can, we can assess the accuracy of the testing. The last thing I, uh, I'll do before Bill comes over here uh, is that uh, one has to be careful about when in the process of the, uh, of the dynamics of the COVID-19 disease, the testing occurs. Because there's about 12, maybe 14, maybe 15 days at the beginning of that before you can actually see the antibody response. So if you test somebody on day five when they have already symptoms, because that is the, 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 the average 5.2 days, you know, of onset of symptoms in uh, in somebody who has the COVID-19 exposure, then you may not have, you know, an antibody testing. And the fact that you will see a positive test later on does not mean reinfection. reinfection. There's a paper out of South Korea that actually is misleading because these 91 patients that they have tested uh, and, and felt that they are reinfected, they are most likely the, the, the ones that have developed the antibodies a little later. There's another study out of uh, Stanford in California, Santa Clara, 3,300 people that were tested there. And that's where, you know, the underestimation of the number of people that are actually uh, positive for COVID-19 was estimated about 85-fold. So, but again, we are... We do this for a living. You know, this is why we went to medical school. This is why we got our PhDs. We are, as the governor correctly said, you know, we are here to serve with that collective distributed expertise across the state with Mayo Clinic, all the healthcare systems, and the, uh, the, the higher education facilities. So you said you got to 100 percent on which test was that? This is actually on both, uh, on the serology side. Is that based on how many tests? So this were several hundred, you know, so, so nothing is hundred in biology, uh, nothing hundred biology in, in medicine and biology, nothing is hundred percent. That's what I meant to say. So this is a, uh, this, I'm sure that there is going to be variance, you know, either way, but these are pretty accurate tests. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Let me just follow up because a couple of you in this room have actually just talked to me recently about this very issue. So I just want to clarify it. Um, one of the challenges we have right now is it is the wild, wild west for testing out there. We just have to be very clear. The FDA feeling a great deal of pressure to release additional tests uh, after the original problems emerged with the CDC basically opened up a process whereby more than 45 
PCR tests have been approved through the emergency use authorization uh, approach. More than 90 serologic antibody tests, which have basically had no review of such, just a filing. And uh, we have seen tremendous differences in these tests. Just today, Abbott announced in its premier test that they had at least a 15% false positive rate, a false negative rate, meaning they were positive when they weren't detected. Uh, and we've been dealing with this. The other challenge we have is, is that for, at least on the serologic test, is why and why I feel so confident about what we're doing here is because this is really a comprehensive system. It's not just testing, it's understanding how the test works, where to use it. Just let me give you an example of the test results are not bi binomial. They're not yes or no. It's not light switch on or off. It's a real stat. And it turns out that we have cutoffs for determining if somebody has antibody or not. And in a low prevalence population, like less than 5%, or in a high prevalence population, over 80%, you get totally different results from the very same test. In a 5%, which is what we'd expect right now, and this is one of the challenges we're dealing with, is that even with a very highly specific and sensitive antibody test, 95% sensitive and 95% specific, if you tested a million people, you assume 50,000 are positive, 5%. Your test would pick up accurately 47,500 of them as being true positives, and you'd miss 2,500 as false, posit false negatives. But you equally pick up 47,500 false positives. Same number of positives that are falsely noted as are really positive. So one of the things we're working on is actually how to apply these tests so that we get the maximum performance. That's why I think this is such a unique system and why I give the governor such credit for bringing together this community group, because it's one thing to test. It's another thing to understand what it means when you test and how to use the data. And so really with the health department, we're bringing together the entire system. The same thing, I also just want to say something, Governor, that you can appreciate very much, and uh, Commissioner Malcolm would be too humble to say this, but Minnesota has a very unique relationship with its local public health agencies here. And uh, as somebody who's been in 87 county courthouses in the state, I understand that very well. And part of what you're hearing also is the back and forth between the local public health agencies, the community health service agencies, and helping to set up these local systems. They know their health care system better than anybody when they live in those towns. And the health department is really plugged into that. And so one of the channels here that's going to be a very important part are the local community health service agencies, which are part of the department. And that also gives me great confidence that this system can work because of that very close health department, local health department area. And, and I give uh, Commissioner Malcolm a great deal of credit for having worked on that. I, Andrea was at the health department for many years, helped set up some of the community health service ag agencies' activities, and she can too attest to the importance of these agencies and how we carry out this work. And I'm, I'm confident that will really enhance our ability with sampling. Thank I think, Teddy, if you're okay, we took a little more time. I think when we get these experts here, if you guys want to go longer, I think we should use them. I, I kind of feel like the viewers today uh, should be able to audit and get credit for introduction to epidemiology. <laughs> so, so all of you out there, turn that in. The University of Minnesota give you credit for that. Um, but this is really helpful because I think these are the things that get lost, uh, if you will, in the fog of war about what's going on because the question was really good. Things have been promised all over the place, but you have to follow that data. So let's go a couple more. As me Murphy with WCCO is getting to that first question a little bit about the practical aspect of this. She asks, if a woman in Maple Grove has symptoms today, can she get a test at her urgent care in Maple Grove or her doctor in Maple Grove today as part of this? If not, when can that woman get this test and where, how much will it cost? Yeah, wonderful question. Yeah. Yeah, you want, that, that is what everybody needs to hear answered. Yeah, and, and absolutely. I mean, the first prize is you can get the test at your regular source of care, and that's what we're going to try to, to clarify and support, is that, that uh, primary care clinics, uh, all the places that people would expect to go to be able to get the care will be Could able to get the in care. Maple Grove this afternoon? Well, I, I'm not sure which system she would be potentially attached to, but that's part of what we're trying to do is is tell people who've been saying I can't I can't take your test because I can't guarantee the back end that we are now saying take the take the sample. We will the system will will get it processed, and that's a big big difference. We are also going to be building, and this isn't ready today, but I hope it will be in the very very near future. Uh, a website to show where all the testing locations are and a call-in capability so that if somebody's having a problem they can call a number and be told well yeah um, unfortunately that that spot is showing red today but go here and get the test so that absolutely that's our goal to get to make sure that people who can't get it where they normally would can be directed to where they can get it same day 
Can sure. I just follow that yeah. up? Um, what day do you hope to have these 20,000 tests? You, you may have mentioned that earlier, but is there is there a specific deadline, specific day you'd like to see us have that 20,000 test? Well, capacity? I think what we're saying is that the the both the U and the and the Mayo together have said that's what's in their what's what's in their pipeline that's in their growth plan with the state's ability to guarantee them um, you know the, the 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 volume to support that uh, that 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 they could grow that we also have as I mentioned we think you know like an 8,000 per test capability in the healthcare delivery systems so uh, but again I want to just reinforce it's and the governor has said this it's not about the magic number and what day are we going to hit it it's that's the kind of capacity we think could satisfy both these clinical needs and the and the surveillance needs in public health. Um, we're not trying to dodge the question, but how quickly we can get there uh, will de will depend on um, you know just a number of factors that we need. To, this has come together so quickly, at least the partnership piece that understanding Mayo and the use timelines for that ramp up and the system's ability to say, okay, we theoretically want to get to 8,000, but how close are they? That We're going to be talking about that every day. What happens if they went to a health partners clinic? Yeah, so, so here's the reality today. Across virtually all of the systems, the healthcare systems in the state today, all of us have prioritized um, testing capacity to make sure we, we manage it to the, the volume of tests we're able to process and have access to. So today, predominantly, the priority for testing has been for healthcare workers to make sure that the care teams in hospitals and clinics are safe. Um, prioritization to patients who are in the hospital, making sure that we understand what the, the health status is of, of patients. And then at within health partners at our respiratory care centers, we have been looking at how do we prioritize testing for patients in nursing, coming from nursing homes and other congregate living settings. <coughs> we are in the process as a result of this partnership and what we're announcing today to figure out how do we operationalize and take a look at greatly expanding that capacity so that we can return to a drive-through testing capability. Will it be there tomorrow? No. Will it be there in the coming days and weeks? It will, and I would advise that, that listener to call into their healthcare system and ask. It will take the healthcare systems a bit of time to set up the operations to do it, but all of us are committed to getting there. We know how important it is to help us in this next phase. Just to, be, just to be clear, you want people to be reaching out, not necessarily going into their clinic, going into their ER, asking, where is my test? That is correct. So here is one of the, the true things. From a safety standpoint, what we need to set up is the ability for some triage. If you have symptoms of COVID, instead of just popping in someplace, dropping by, we want an outreach. We want and are setting up the ability to do some triage. Within Health Partners today, if you are a patient and you call and you tell us that you, you have symptoms, we will direct you to our respiratory care center. Today, we have not been testing patients. We've been providing care with the assumption if you have the symptoms, you likely have COVID. Um, what will change as we move forward is we'll have the capacity to be able to test and confirm. To Dr. Toller's point, that will provide great peace of mind for our patients. So you can get the care today. You can't necessarily get the test today, and that's what will change in the future. Um, yeah. I have a follow-up to that, too. Now, given uh, that health plans in Minnesota have waived uh, co-pays for testing and, and for care, as I understand it, uh, who's paying for these tests in the end if you know we're going to have up to, to 20,000 a day am I uh, if I, you know I have health partners insurance does health partners uh, cover all of that is there state money covering these tests too how's it all get paid for that's a great question and I would say that is one of the very things that needs to be worked out as we move forward clearly clinical testing the 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 clinical medical part of this is covered through insurance. The surveillance, the population health, public health part of this, we need to figure that out. And so as we stand here today, we don't have all of those answers, but what you have is a community commitment to working through to figure that kind of thing out. I have a question here on behalf of uh, Jeremy Olson over at the Star Tribune, and he's asking, um, are you, Governor, concerned that the federal government could use its authority, swoop in and say, you know, you've got a good thing going here in Minnesota um, and take over our expanded testing capacity, go after 
uh, the supplies that we need uh, to conduct all these tests. Yeah, I don't think worried about it. I, I think these stories have come up some, and I wanted to be clear that I, I think we kind of set the tone for this, uh, speaking with the federal government, speaking with the president. Um, I took very seriously, and I was just got that opportunity the other night on Saturday night to lay out where we were headed with this. And and I think the president was uh, was impressed by that, was saying this is what we need to do. I think probably what I expect to happen here is is a lot of folks to try and model this. But I, I want to be very clear, sometimes in Minnesota, we the air we be, this collaboration while it seems like this is exactly what every state should do, I remind folks um, to get this type of cooperation in New York, three days ago, Governor Cuomo had to do an executive order after all this. They hadn't got to that point through doing all of this. That's a testament to these folks. So I don't worry about them doing that. I, I do know that there's, you know, there's angst around the whole deal. I think we're in a much better space. And I, I think this is, you know, I'm listening to the experts who helped craft this. I think this is the model um, to get this right. But um, we still have to deal with this this idea of 50 state strategy and i feel very uh a sense of responsibility is one of the things is is that we'll be sharing tonight i'll be on a call tonight with the other six governors in our northern compact sharing how this works they're very interested to see how this goes and i think maybe more than likely you'll see this replicated elsewhere Dana? Governor, a question from steve karnowski at the ap um, how does this increase testing capacity affect uh, potential decisions around reopening schools, businesses, and lifting the state's stay-at-home No, it's a great question. The question about how, how does this play into it. I've said all along that, that testing is one of those criteria that, that we look at of restarting, uh, looking to see what type of uh, impact we're having with social distancing, and then lessons learned elsewhere. I, I've been saying this. I, I think it's a mistake um, what some states are doing without the testing capacity. Uh, states in the bottom five, several of those states, like Texas, are the states that are talking about opening up. I don't know how they have a site picture on what they have. And unfortunately, I think we're going to learn a lot from that experiment. Un uh, you know, the fortunate, I guess, for us to learn, but I think it's going to come at a real cost. For us, we've always talked about before you can really talk about expanding some of this, you see this testing as being a piece of it. And I, I, I think it's going to be critical. I think it is certainly playing into our thinking as we have this capacity. I have, of course, uh, we and Jan and everyone here has been looking at the situation in Worthington and now talking to all of these others because there better be a lesson learned from that to be able to swoop in and stop this from happening in some of those others. I think those lessons learned certainly give us a better capacity to think about how do you roll things out smartly. I just have to tell you, I again, I don't want to single out a lot of states, but there's some of these states that it's almost as if they put together a list of opening places that are the very worst to open. And I, I am not thinking how that fits with their inability to test. And, and I want to assure Minnesotans that the sense of urgency you feel around the economy um, is weighing on every single one of us. But I, I hope you know this is one of those tools to be coming back. So for Steve and everybody else asking this, absolutely this is going to play in our decisions. And I think this, again, I had the real sense. I don't think this is a secret to anybody. We did these two stay-at-home orders with the idea in the first one we would help build the supply chains and the capacities at the hospitals and the coordination and in the second one we would build out the tools necessary to maybe be able to use lessons learned and open more businesses safely that's what this is so that's why during this period um it was so critical so yes we will it will absolutely play into our thinking i think there'll be lessons learned and again every single day we're going to learn more i mean if you're going to open um spas bowling alleys, um, massage parlors, and uh, theaters in Georgia, we're going to learn a lot in the next week of what that's going to do. And um, I think for us, we're also going to learn a lot. What happens when you're able to open up a facility, test everyone at a plant, uh, be able to monitor the hot spots, be able to put up protective uh, shielding and spacing folks out, can you operate a plant safely in that mode? And, and that might be, uh, I think Mike talks about it a lot, and, and the business community knows this. There's two sides to the equation. There's the retailer and there's the customer. If the customer doesn't come in, it doesn't matter if you're open or not. And the idea that people would flock back in if they didn't think it was safe, I think if you know that Minnesota has more testing than any place else on the planet, and we're getting a real picture of that, I think it breeds confidence back into the system sooner. That's our theory. So, get time for another one or so, Teddy? We took a little longer in the, and you got experts here, so. 
Well, this is probably more for Jan because we've heard a lot about part of this strategy being contact tracing and how do you keep pace with maybe 20,000 tests a day and a big spike in cases, especially in light of factoring in asymptomatic spread. They're not being tested, correct? That, that's correct, and that will be part of the surveillance and the going, going looking for, uh, for where there may be spread that we don't know. And we're learning a lot from others that, uh, that are doing kind of surveillance testing. So we, are, we have been ramping up our capacity at the State Health Department. Um, we started with, I think, 20-some uh, case investigators. We have 100 now. Um, local public health is a big key to this, as Mike has said. We've got folks in, not all, because uh, some of our smaller uh, health departments have really shrunk in recent years, so trying to figure out how we can surge the capacity on the investigation side, working with our colleagues at the School of Public Health. We've got a lot of uh, health students in the pipeline, public health students, nursing, physicians, pharmacy. I mean, we've got a lot of workforce that we, uh, we hope to be able to train up to do this and support them and oversee them from a, a MDH and local public health standpoint. But I, I, uh, we're building it up quickly. And I think there's also some interesting technological um, enhancements to the, to the person power to help us um, you know, make some extrapolations with, with some of that data and collect the data faster. So, uh, but it's a great question and we, sh we should and will follow up on kind of th that end of the system as well and what's the surge there because that there, we also need one. And, uh, Commissioner, you mentioned that this was phase one. What is phase two? What does that look like? Well, this was just to say we, and the reason we went to the COVID-19 fund, which we're so grateful to the legislature for giving us resource that we could jump on quickly, uh, was to start building this system, start building the, the machinery and the logistics to support this, to lock in the capacity uh, that, we, that we believe is, exists in the state if we can agree how we're going to use it, which we have now. Um, but this phase one is really just a, uh, worth, we're envisioning that's a three to four week period at most in which we're really building up the supply, working out the logistics, getting things moving as a coordinated system. And then we, we will be going to the legislature and we are hoping that some of this federal money that's just being uh, dedicated to testing now is gonna be a, a real source of reimbursement for that as well. So we're, phase two is, okay, now we've built this great system. How do we maximize uh, using it for, for all of Minnesota? Last question today. I'm gonna give you two quick questions. Quick questions. Um, first, can we get an update about the plants in Worthington, Wilmer, Wyndham, um, and what you're seeing out there? And then from our folks up in Brainerd, they're wondering, there's some confusion about resorts. Can resorts be open right now? Uh, things like RV resorts, should people be traveling distances? Yeah, resorts have been able to be open this whole time, not the communal activities, the pools, the water parks, whatever that might be. Um, so there were certain restrictions on that, but not that just like hotels could be open and not just for healthcare workers. I think the question is again there is, is, is how do you ensure people can come back? I think for some of these resorts, if you had rooms and your golf courses were open, were a part of that, um, that we think that we can do that. And I think you'll hear in the next, uh, the next day or so, a little more guidance around how we're thinking about that. Jan, I might have you talk about how we're seeing this. I, I do want to say uh, the appreciation for the entire community, Mayor Cooley down in Worthington, the folks at JBS, the folks um, in public health, and the UFCW and, and their workers down there. This was one case of where being able to speak with that loud voice, uh, being on the phone um, with Matt, their folks who are calling me, um, they're scared, they're worried, and, um, and, and for me, I get... I guess I'm frustrated. I want to protect them even more than we can. I think the good news out of the lesson in Worthington is, if I'm Jan, maybe you can talk about this, um, of taking the model of getting in early, fast. And I would say, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, Jan, um, voluntarily in Wyndham, they, uh, they shut down for two days. They're going in. They're retooling how their line works. If I'm not mistaken, we had a single case there at this time in the, in the Wyndham area. Um, but I think they saw a lot of lessons learned. They're going to clean and try and come back up on Friday if that works. In Worthington, the community is setting up, and Jan, you again, check. I think we're going to try and do massive testing of everybody. We've been given all the names and contact information. They're setting up at the ice arena there. Um, they'll be coming down on the fairgrounds to get everybody done. Is that? that 
Yes, that, that's exactly right, Governor. The one day I don't have Chris Harrisman, my safety net here, because uh, she would know right now what is what are the current case counts. I do not have that information at my fingertips, unfortunately. But uh, the governor's right. It was uh, uh, the local public health and uh, and Sanford in this case were ready very quickly to stand up uh, um, and expand a testing operation. We the companies agreed to to uh, to give us access to the employee roster so that we can you know proactively reach out and know how many we've tested. But it's also important to test more broadly in the community. We know there's community spread there. I think that's why the Wyndham plant uh, was rightly concerned uh, because of the mobility of the workforce back and forth, shared housing, all of that. Uh, it just makes sense to take this as a broader regional and community effort. So standing up the testing, uh, working with with all of the uh, plants that might be in working in similar conditions to immediately kind of proactively take those lessons learned to start putting more controls in their process is exactly what we're trying to do. But we, have, I know we've, uh, there have been uh, well over, I don't know by this time, I hope well over 500 uh, people tested uh, in Worthington. Um, and, uh, and, and the case investigations are a little, going a little slower than they usually do just because of the language and mobility challenges. But um, we're making good progress on, under, on getting those case investigations and contacts identified and, and working hard to get them into safe housing is for is one really important thing. Governor, your final thoughts before we wrap. Yeah, again, thank you. And I think on this cost and working with the legislature, one thing is we're seeing that there was an initial $36 million to help with this process. Um, just think about we get this right. If we, if we can get things moving even one day sooner because we did things right on the front end instead of rushing into this, um, we will recoup all of that so quickly. So I think in the Minnesota way, I, I told you about a moonshot. Um, the ship is on the launch pad today. It has been built by the best engineers. It is staffed by the best astronauts um, that we have, and, and it's ready to go. But there's a lot of work yet to get it there. The sense of urgency that we're feeling is real. Um, but once again, Minnesota, you as a state have invested over the years in these institutions. You've invested a resiliency that uh, allows us to be able to do this. If we did not have this, we couldn't approach what we're trying to do here. And again, we are inventing the wheel, if you will. It has not been done. There's there's some models out there, and not all of them are perfect. We needed the Minnesota model, and and this is it today. So I'm uh, I'm incredibly proud of that. I would uh, I would note that this sense of uh, just being in it together, I, I get some of the the best stuff gets sent to me. I would uh, they made me a, a photocopy of one that we brought up. There's a kids all over the state are sitting at home and writing cards to people who are in the hospital who might not be able to see them. And I just wanted to uh, to read you one of these. It says, good morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you're reading this. I don't know you or what you're going through, but I do know this can be really scary for you. If you're fighting this disease, keep fighting, stay positive, and I hope your pain eases soon and you get better. Um, our kids know what's right about this. They know we're in this together. We know this is scary. It's hard. Um, but I heard all of these experts here say that um, fear comes out of ignorance. Fear comes out of not having the facts. Um, what builds confidence and what builds and what we've always moved forward is we tackle things with science. We tackle it with facts. We tackle it with a sense of community and a sense of compassion for our neighbors. And, and I'm just proud to say um, this is a great first step. We've got a ways to go, Minnesota. But this is so Minnesotan way to approach this. And so, uh, again, on behalf of all those Minnesotans out there, thank you to this team who put it together. For all of you who are out there, here we go. Let's get this thing done, and we'll be back with you uh, soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Governor, you're coming out this way. All There's no way I'm not showing off my Minnesota Twins mask.